Our next guest tonight is a uh, very talented and a very funny performer who uh, currently is in the midst of a successful engagement right here in New York City at Lincoln Center. And he is also the author of this book right here. It's entitled Sex and Death to the Age 14. This man has been called everything from a wasp Woody Allen to a spaced out Norman Rockwell. Please, folks, welcome Spalding Gray. Yeah. Hi, Spalding. Good to meet you, Kevin. Come on over and have a seat here. You know, uh, I think some people, uh, myself included, might have uh, a difficult time in describing you properly or introducing you adequately. Did, was that all right, what we just said here? Does that come close to anything you are? That's the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, for, oh, I, you know, one thing I wanted to say about uh, inexpensive beauty aids. Oh, good. Uh, that brought up a memory watching that on the, on the monitor outside. When my brother and I first uh, realized we were going bald, we started using early morning urine. Uh, no, he insisted it worked. And uh, what we do is disguise it by putting it in a, in a hair tonic bottle because we couldn't put it on our hair uh, right off like that, you know, just in a cup. And it is a fantastic way to kind of recycle all of that stuff and very inexpensive. Let me, let me ask you one important question here. Whose? I'd use mine, he'd use his. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, and it's, it has uh, restorative powers? It didn't work. Oh, it didn't work. Yeah. The Germans used it in World War II, and the Peruvians use it uh -huh. in Peru. <laughs> so today I was going through trying to figure out who I was exactly through uh -huh. the files, all, all of the, uh, the reviews. I got very nervous because I realized that no one knew who I was. And uh, that scared me. I got really cotton mouth and was afraid mm -hmm. to come on. Yeah. I thought, how am I going to do it in eight minutes? And um, so I ate a half a pound of turkey. Mm -hmm. It actually has a natural enzyme in it, uh, tryptophan. Tryptophan, yeah. Yeah, which is that a real... Helps another, you relax. Yeah. yeah. So I came up with a wasp, Woody Allen, which you said, based mm -hmm. on Norman Rockwell, a combination of uh, Russell Baker and Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Lauren playing a younger version of Carl Sandburg, <laughs> a combination of Huck Finn and Candide, yeah. a horny pilgrim, <laughs> a new wave Mark Twain. Uh -huh. I a, like that. Yeah, yeah you do? I do like that, yeah. Why? Uh, just I like the I like the ring to it, and, and I guess I understand that one a little more you know, than some of those when I read that one to my When I read that one to my brother, he said it's a contradiction of terms, New Wave Mark Twain. It'd be impossible to have that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I said yeah, that. But, of course, he was putting urine on his head, so what, <laughs> what does this guy know? Um, <laughs> James Joyce, Dr. Hunter S. Thompson, a male Lily Tomlin, a Chinese nesting toy, or an intricate trick box. Uh, this is getting a little uptown for How me I here. spent my summer... How I Sent My Summer Vacation Elevated to the Realm of Art, and last of all, a cross between David Letterman and Andy Warhol. There you go. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one there. Um, now, let's, let's talk about your show, the one at Lincoln Center, and I guess you do it all over the United States, don't you, Spoke? Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's uh, a presentation of monologues. Is that... That's it. I sit behind a table yeah. and talk for an hour and How 40 minutes. How did this minutes. begin? Um, well, it began in the performing garage downtown here. Mm -hmm. I was talking a lot and a uh, com combination of things. I wanted to go into therapy. Right. I thought that I could talk it out there. Classical psychoanalysis, but they rejected me three times at the Columbia Presbyterian Institute. Oh, really? Why? Oh, they said I traveled too much and that um, real deep therapy was a very dangerous thing and I should go into mild therapy first, uh -huh. like, you know, one hour a week. But I wanted to talk every night or every day. So I started doing it uh, to my audience. Yeah. And the first monologue I did was in 1979 in the performing garage called Sex and Death to the Age 14, in which I sit there and try to remember everything I could about yeah. sex and death until I was 14, which isn't much. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but it's a, it is a therapeutic uh, endeavor then? Well, no. <laughs> no, it's, it, I, it sounded that way. I make a living yeah. from it now. Yeah. You're, it got you're, also, you're also an actor? Have we, have we seen you in films? Uh, oh, God, just barely. I mean, if you blinked, you could have missed it in The Killing Fields. I had a small role in there. I was the American ambassador's aide. Although the other day I was walking up Broadway, and a bus driver got off a bus and said, weren't you in The Killing Fields? Yeah. I remember you were the American ambassador's aide. I was amazed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that long a ago. Bus driver. That long ago. A bus driver said this? Yeah, and I, st <laughs> I would still get across borders with, the, with my passport. You, it's actor on my passport. Do you, uh, do you spend a lot of time in Los Angeles getting work? I mean, do you... Do uh, I've had a rough time with Los Angeles. After I did The Killing Fields, I couldn't make up my mind whether I wanted to work for the Cambodian refugees or become an actor. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I did the wrong thing. <laughs> I, I, I opted for the actor because I had been trained to be an actor at Emerson College. So I went off to Hollywood and, and, and I just, you know, would go up for everything. I got an agent, first of all. First thing that they sent me up was for Hail to the Chief. 
I was supposed to be Patty Duke's husband in the sitcom Hail to the Chief. She is uh, the uh, first woman president. Right. I was supposed to be her husband. Mm -hmm. It was me, between me and Dick Sean, and it was real close, except he was funnier than I, I am, <laughs> and, and he had memorized all his lines. Uh -huh. But I said to my friends when I got back to the East Coast, why Patty Duke was on book, she hadn't memorized her lines. They said, she's got the role. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So uh, <laughs> now I'm working on memorizing the lines. So, yeah. so then I was called back, uh, was sent out for a number of things. I didn't want to do any judgment, you know, like the I Ching says, no judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was just trying to be very open to the whole situation. St. Elsewhere I was up for, they sent me up for a Bowery bum, you know, which uh, they said all I had to do was not shave for five days and not eat. Well, I said I'd stop eating when I signed the contract, <laughs> but I wouldn't shave. Now, it's very easy to look like a Bowery bum in Hollywood. Or, or you know, I mean, just put on a raincoat and a t-shirt. And my problem was that I thought I was the only one up for it, and I arrived and all these other Bowery bums were sitting in the waiting room, you know, with yeah. me. <laughs> all these guys with raincoats on. So part of my problem with being an actor is I look around and go, well, he could do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, what's wrong with him? Yeah. You know? I mean, I think I'd make a better casting director, right? So this guy starts in on my while we're waiting. He says, oh, wow, my agents really made it for me, man. I was drinking a fifth of scotch. I was drinking a fifth of scotch a week in New York City. They fly me out on the plane on Christmas Eve, so I'll have a seat to lie down on. They front me $2,000. <laughs> they give me a car. They're sending me out for everything. I haven't had a drink since I've been in L.A. I thought... Let him have it. <laughs> Perfect. So next thing they send me up for is for, um, uh, you know, Mr. Sunshine. You know, I think it's on now. Henry Linko, Winkler was producing. It's the, the story of a man who... Uh, uh, a a psych college professor. Yeah, yeah. professor which I, I was teaching college at the time, mm -hmm. so I thought it'd be perfect. Yeah. He had just uh, gotten divorced. Uh, I've never been married, but I have been separated, mm -hmm. so I could relate to that. Uh, and just after he got divorced, he went blind. Right. And it was a sitcom. So all the great blind jokes was wedged into that first mm -hmm. uh, pilot, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I arrived for it, and I was rolling up the window, and I looked out, and a, an actual blind man was passing by my car. And I thought, uh-huh, some message there. And I came in, and uh, Henry said, here he is, folks, Spalding Gray. Uh, Henry had seen me before do my sure. monologue with a box of cards, mm -hmm. which have titles on it. He says, this man uh, stands in front of an uh, audience naked with a box of cards. Mm -hmm. Now, they're very liberal-minded in Hollywood. They slowly <laughs> turn to see if I'm dressed. You know? I said, I sit, Henry, I sit in front of a box of cards. So he says, um, would you please read for it? So I read for it, and the co-producer says, you're a little soft. I said, well, I'll go a little loud. He said, but I don't think a college professor would talk that soft. Yeah. I said, but I am one. Yeah. I am a college professor. He said, but you're not blind. And I you'd compensate for yeah. the blindness. So I go a little louder, okay. and they say, thank you very much for coming in. When I get out in my Nissan Sentra, I turn on the radio, and they have, they're reading from Shostakovich's diaries, of all things, at noon. And they're talking about Stalin taking all of the blind storytellers and, and uh, poets and lining them up against a pit and shooting them. I let that one go. <laughs> you know, you've got to learn to read the signs, you know? <laughs> they're coming at you all the time, particularly in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. My... My, what a strange affair. Oh, it, that's not the end of it. Yeah, it goes finally, on. Finally, 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 I almost starred opposite Farrah Fawcett yeah. in a TV uh, movie for the week. But you didn't, you didn't get that one. Um, they thought I thought too much. Uh, in the final analysis, they saw this wrinkle between my eyes and said that I didn't have that go-for-it spirit, that I was hesitating. <laughs> that, no, they wanted to know if I could love Farrah Fawcett on camera. Yeah. And, I got very confused because I, I didn't even know her. I said, you do? They said, you do love her, don't you? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I, I don't know her. Don't so, know her, uh, yeah. They said, well, you've got to act like you love her. Well, that's very confusing. I act like I, I love my girlfriend often. Right. You know, I put, yeah. my, I, I put my arm around sure. her. I, I act like that. You know, I kiss yeah. her. So it's all a very confusing thing to act, you know. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, uh, your uh, one-man shows are going quite nicely, and you have your book here. Uh, you have it. There. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Sex and Death at the Age 14, and uh, this gentleman is a, a, a Spalding Gray. Contemporary Gulliver. Listen, listen, can you come back again another time? Oh, yeah, when? All right. Well, as soon as you can. Oh, absolutely. We'll work something out. All right, absolutely. Spalding Gray, folks. We'll be right back with Benny King. Our uh, next guest has been described as being a waspy Woody Allen and a new wave Mark Twain. He is a talented performer and writer, and he is now starring in a film version of his monologue entitled Swimming to Cambodia. Please welcome back Spalding Gray. Oh, Spalding. Hi. Good to see you. 
<laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> Don't worry about me. I'll be just fine. How you doing? I'm well. Thanks I'm for coming back. When yeah. you were here the first time, I guess, what, six months ago or so? Uh, August. Months? In yeah. August, yeah. Right. Uh, and that was your first time on our show. Did you get any kind of response? I'm always interested in whether it, it means anything to a person's life God, when they come on the show. God, it changed my life in a strange way. <laughs> Uh, for instance, my father, I don't think he's ever heard of you. They go to, my father and stepmother go to bed at 9 right, o'clock right. at night, and they set the alarm to get up at 1. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember you had Raquette on. That's where we had the international beauty and, secrets. And she night. reminded me of how my brother and I used to try to cure our baldness with early morning urine. <laughs> oh, God. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, my stepmother And I heard... asked you how you applied it. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my stepmother heard that opening line and uh -huh. went to bed. Uh, they after that. She, <laughs> they no, she, it right my off. father watched it. Yeah. He kept it on. But she wouldn't speak to me uh, for two weeks uh, after that. Yeah. For saying, she, how, she said, this is your chance. You're on national television. You could talk about such a thing. Well, it's an obscenity. <laughs> well, I did the old Lenny Bruce line. Well, how do you watch the evening news? You yeah. know, but she, yeah. that went right over her. Didn't make know. a dent. Mm. Yeah. So uh, also my brother, is uh, my older brother teaches uh, English in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, at, a, at a boys' school, the emphasis is on sports and, and business, uh, you know, getting into business now. Mm -hmm. But he, his favorite book is Walden, you know, Thoreau's Walden. Mm -hmm. Do you know the book? Well, sure. Oh. And, um... <laughs> Not exactly no, dealing no, with a no, chimp no, here, you know. <laughs> anyway, he's trying to teach that book, and they said, what are they all going to, you know, Dr. Gray. Mm -hmm. my, my, that's what they call my yeah. brother, Rocky, Rocky Gray, Dr. Mm -hmm. Gray. Um, what is this man doing in the woods for you when he could be making money, you know? So finally, I, uh, I came to the school to talk because my book, Sex and Death to the Age 14, that you held up in August, well, that, they had that at the school. All right. And my brother wanted the kids to ask questions of me, and, and all they wanted to know was, what's David Letterman really like? Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that was the major questioning in the class. And yeah. uh, they're probably watching tonight, and I'm sure they want me to... What are you really like? <laughs> well, just just an average guy trying to make a buck. But you, you're not self-destructive. And well, that was that was uh, that was that should never have happened. Yeah. And it, we'll probably edit that out. I was, uh, I was so surprised. What? Uh, uh, tell, tell me about yourself. I yeah. I know that you're kind of uh, strange things happen to you. You do strange things, and you're sort of superstitious. I am. Superstitious. You're not. You're uh, not superstitious. Uh, not that I would write anything down, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually it started obsessively way back with, with the, not so far back, with The Killing Fields, the mm -hmm. film. I wanted to get in it very badly. Yeah. And I didn't know how to get in, because I had no contacts with the British film industry. Mm -hmm. And the uh, first thing that occurred to me was prayer, actually. And I thought, that has been so long. Uh, you know, God would know I was in bad faith. Uh -huh. And uh, th then these kind of strange magical thinking, you know, started to happen where if I did certain actions, like um, I, I couldn't leave my loft. You know, you know what a loft is, yeah. right? Yeah, um, an old upper warehouse kind of right. thing. Right, I live in one of those. Yeah. And I couldn't leave it without turning off the radio on a positive word. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd have to listen all morning sometimes mm -hmm. or all day. <laughs> so if I could go, the stock market is rising. I could go out, Turn, you see, yeah. or, or something like that. Consider moving Marines to safer positions, <laughs> and I could go out. And I found that that wasn't enough. I was beginning to turn the doorknob three times and snapping three times mm -hmm. on the way to the supermarket yeah. to buy soup. Every third can was fine. The first two had botched. Or more, you know, or more likely cyanide. Well, look, I was doing all this magical thinking. It was getting quite obsessive. Yeah. And um, I, t I got the role in the film. Now, I, I really got the role in the film because my will came in, you mm -hmm. know, which I didn't know anything about at all. The will said, if you will this magical thinking to stop, this will get you the role in the film. Now, since I got the role in now, the wait film... A do, do that for me again. If you will... Yeah, you must stop. Just hold still. Uh -huh. Don't snap anymore. Knock don't, off the goofy yeah, behavior. Right. I see. And just say, I am going to will whatever that is yeah. just say that word i'm gonna will that i get this role in the film right do you know what i mean vaguely yeah yeah well but, but i've lost a lot the, of blood here to yes, <laughs> but the, they, the point is the magical thinking has taken over yeah. i got the role in the film so i began to think well what do i want now what do i want next because this this and and the superstition can leave I, well i've lately i've wanted to live forever and um no you're not serious about that are you yes really well get you know Stay around, get reborn, reincarnated, I you know, this, this kind of thing. Yeah. I, I don't want to give up on the earth yet. Yeah. I'm very attached to do you, it. Do you feel you've been here before in a couple of different No, yeah. no, I have no feeling yeah. about that at all. But I know I want to come back. Yeah. So the point is, I've got, it's gotten more obsessive. Like, I couldn't, this tie. You see, I have to now tie in order, I don't know why I wore the tie. But I thought it was a good luck. It was a present. It's an old, looks like an old tie. It looks tie. like an old yeah. tie, but it's really not. It's, it, oh, I think it's, maybe it is, but someone gave it recently. I have to tie it until it, the bottom you see, isn't, 
The bottom can't be longer than mm -hmm. the top. It has yeah. to line up just like that. So it took about six ties yeah. to get out of the loft uh, today. And then <laughs> still with, with the doorknobs <laughs> turning three times and the knocking on wood, when you can find wood, you've got wood here. Yeah. That's a specialty item. Well, this is network wood. It's not actual wood. Oh, it's it NBC <laughs> wood. Uh, no. we, have to, we have to do a commercial, and then uh, I want you to tell me about uh, working on the killing fields. Good. We'll be back here uh, with Spalding Gray. <laughs> Here, uh, the, the new movie is uh, a film version of what you do in person. It's your monologue that we talked about in the opening of uh, that, your introduction. That, that's right. It's, it's swimming it's, to Cambodia. It's like a documentary. Jonathan Demme uh, directed it. I, I asked Jonathan to do it after I saw the Talking Heads mm -hmm. film. You know, right. stop making sense right. because I thought it was a really good example of a director kind of submerging his ego to the material, and he was great. I mean, we had. Th Three 35-millimeter cameras running in live mm -hmm. performance at the performing garage. Did you, did you find yourself altering your performance at all for the film? or just Yeah, pretty much yeah. For instance, here, when I first uh, came here on the show, I got very confused because I'm really used to relating to an audience. Suddenly, the audience is way back there. Then, mm -hmm. then we have three cameras here. We have you. I didn't know which way to turn. Yeah. Uh, and if now that I look around, I feel dizzy again. <laughs> and in, in the case of making the film, it was like I was trying to look past the cameras to yeah. reach the audience. And Jonathan's one direction was be generous to the camera. Yeah. So I began to learn how to play more to the camera. It's distracting if you see your reflection in the lens. Now, now Swimming to Cambodia deals with your experiences uh, working in the killing fields, right? That's right. And, and what yeah. was your part like? Well, uh, it, it really is one of those parts, if you blinked, you'd miss it. It was mm -hmm. a facilitator, and that's why I was able to make the monologue, because I was playing the American ambassador's aide. Mm -hmm. It was a very straight part, you know, and as a result, I, I, I had a lot of chance to observe kind of humorous back-behind-the-scenes type things. I, I feel that, the, you know, the Cambodian genocide is a horrible thing, but I I if you can make a little bit of lightness and balance it off, I think the, mon the monologue is very, is very funny in that way. I mean, it tells behind-the-scenes stories about what it's like to make a film and the ridiculousness of that. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for instance, I was playing the American ambassador's aide, and the American ambassador was being played by Ira Wheeler, who, who, who is a vice president of, of a chemical uh, a factory, of a chemical factory, chemical a chemical manufacturing company here mm -hmm. in the United States and came into film acting very late. So he was studying Stanislavski and acting at 63 years old and he had all of the Stanislavski books there and he was trying to do emotional memory, you know, so I, that I he would... Well, uh, oh, God, yeah, um, I barely do myself. If you're trying to cry now, <laughs> right, or feel sad, you would think of something like yeah. cutting your hand. Right, uh, of, yeah. you know, I have a guy come up from Atlantic City <laughs> right, and butcher me is what I actually do. do. You'd think of something <laughs> from, you know, preferably your far... Trying to way Call back. those go inner back, emotions. Go back, so, go yeah. in so that you can you can cry on. And, and see, Roland Jaffe told Ira to look like he was on the verge of tears. Uh -huh. Now, up until then, we'd been friends, but suddenly we're in the back of this Cadillac limousine. The first thing that happens is the electric windows break, then the air conditioner breaks, the radiator ball boils over, the the whole exhaust system is dragging on this football right. field. I, I feel this is ludicrous. I, I'm I'm <laughs> laughing, but we're supposed to be on the on the verge of tears. Right. Ira, who's playing the American ambassador, is sweating. This right. man, he sweats like a, as I say, like an Ira, that's the only thing I can say. I mean, I mean, this man sweats so much that he claims he beats his opponents at squash by leaving puddles on the floor for Ooh. them to slip in. You know, they were changing his shirt. He was in a slough of despond. Meanwhile, I'm bored, so I'm trying to talk to the driver, who is an American expatriate from San Francisco, mm -hmm. who is an elephant expert. I mean, his job is to count elephants for mm -hmm. the Thai Agricultural Committee. Mm -hmm. And he's telling me that he can't run anymore. He's got a bum leg. And he's afraid an elephant will stampede, uh, right. kill him at some point. It's interesting. And we all have our little worries in our own particular existence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, absolutely. And, I, and Ira says, will you stop talking about whatever you're talking about? I'm trying to have an emotional <laughs> memory. I said, Ira, here's a guy that's about to be killed by an elephant. Try working with that one. Said, <laughs> this was the kind of behind the thing. I mean, it was the bottom of the iceberg. I'll take the bottom of the iceberg any day over the tip, you see. I, I always find the bottom is more interesting. And Swimming to Cambodia, the monologue, is the yeah, bottom of the iceberg. Yeah. The film is the tip. And there's three, one, Jonathan Demme uses three minutes from the actual film yeah. cut beautifully into the, into the film. Is, the is it strange for you? It must be, too, to suddenly walk into a big, dark theater and see you 
uh, up on stage and also up on a big illuminated screen there. Huh? Oh, it's awful. You see, I, I, that's when I knew I wasn't a narcissist. Up until then, I, I thought I was. Yeah, you yeah. say didn't appeal it, to it you. It was not appealing at all. Uh, when is this film opening? Uh, probably in, in Friday the thirteenth. Friday the thirteenth here in New York. In New York yes, City, and, and then, then April Fool's Day across the country. Great, yeah. great. Yeah. I hope it's a great success yeah. for you. Thanks, Thanks to see you, Thank you. Paul. And thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be uh, right back, kids, in about sixty seconds. If you can prove that you were watching tonight's show, go to the affiliate and prove that. I'll do one show for you free. Uh, our next guest uh, wrote and starred in the uh, one-man film uh, called Swimming to Cambodia. He's currently performing his latest monologue, uh, which is called Monster in a Box, here at Lincoln Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Spalding Gray. Spalding? for coming back. You were on the program years and years ago. It was. It was 20 years ago. <laughs> You're in top form tonight. You're and, and, and much success has come your way since the, in the time being. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, had, I hadn't noticed, but thank you. No, 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 no. Uh, Have you noticed? Yeah. What? Yeah, the, that you've enjoyed a great deal of success. What? How did you find how, Where did you hear about that? Well, just by being alive and walking around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, all right, tell people what you've been up to since we last saw well, you. It's more or less down, really. No, <laughs> I no, may see no, your no, no. is up. Well, I, you know, the film was very successful, mm -hmm. Swimming to Cambodia, right. and I decided to put everything aside and write a novel, an autobiographic novel, and uh, I got a contract to do it. It wasn't my idea, but when they gave it to me, I decided I would do it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was Kanaf. Mm -hmm. It is Kanaf. And yeah. as soon as I got the contract, I started getting all of these offers. And I said yes to all of them. I got, I got weak, I got greedy, mm -hmm. and I, I collapsed under the yeses. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm just pulling out. I'm doing a new monologue about the collapse yeah. of the, under the yeses. And, and then, then what did you do then? You, be, you, you went home and you began working on the book? I, I went home and started working on the book, and then I started getting the phone calls to do these things, and I said yes to them. I put the book aside, or I tried to work on the book. In the morning. I went to the McDowell Colony in Peterborough, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. to work on the book, and I was isolated in a little Now, now describe that for us a little bit. Well, what it's 600 that? acres of forest with 52 little houses, and they put me in a house named the Bates House, for starters. So, uh, I, I, you know, it was named after McDowell's nurse, actually. He died of, no one knows this, but uh, very few people know it, he died of syphilis. Ooh. And this nurse was <laughs> nursing him back. Well, I put me in the Bates House, I tried to write, and I, my hands uh, started swelling up. I was writing longhand, and, and I started losing my sight in my left eye. Mm -hmm. And I was working on my, all my Oedipal themes, and I thought, oh, God, no, there goes the first eye, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, <laughs> actually, my left foot began to swell up as well. Yeah. And I think Oedipus means swollen foot. It was a hellish time, and I just wanted to get out of there. Uh -huh. And so I took the first so thing. So all, that came all of these symptoms were, were n nothing really, maybe psychosomatic? Well, actually, the eye, t I had to have an operation for my eye. Oh, is so, that right? Yeah, I had that. And, oh, and, um, but things and, are good now. Uh, better, yeah, better. Yeah, um, yeah. You're coming into focus. Uh, right. and, and <laughs> <laughs> so the first offer that I got, I took immediately just to get out of the woods of New Hampshire mm -hmm. and writing that book, and it was to go to Los Angeles to try to find people just on the streets of L.A., interesting, regular people who were not involved in the film industry. That right. was the criteria. That, oh, oh, I right. see. To find somebody who was not connected yeah, 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 yeah. to the I making thought, of I, pictures. I, I thought it would be very easy until I got out there. I saw a television special in which they were interviewing people in a parking lot of a shop, right? So people came out with their groceries. Uh -huh. They'd run up and just say, hi, good morning. How's your film script going? And everyone <laughs> said, really? How did you know? Right up to the cashier, right? <laughs> so the idea was to have them up and interview them like we are sitting yeah, here, although yeah. I take, uh, oh, half an hour with each one of yeah. them. And... Uh, so uh, finding them was al almost impossible. They had an assistant driving me around. Uh -huh. And um, this just, there's no there there, as the saying goes. I, I would drive down to Long Beach to look for Cambodian refugees. I'd go downtown talking to homeless people. It, it, it was, uh, I found people, yeah. but they were not in involved in the film industry, granted, but they were all making their own movies in their head, I, I think. I think that's how <laughs> I interpret this. Well, there are, there are people there, but certainly not in the density or concentration that they are in New York City. But I don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. 
You see, I, I was the only one that walked in my neighborhood. There, there, there were no uh, neighbors out on their lawns. The, the, the only thing in my neighborhood I heard was birds and wind chimes. You know, it was like a, a neutron <laughs> bomb had hit and left birds and wind chimes. Um, the only people I ever saw, actually, was rounding the corner of the street one day. I saw these school books thrown in the gutter. Uh -huh. And there was a Mex Mexican-American boy and girl making love on the side of the street. Passionately. Wow. I stood over them and watched them French kiss. They paid me no heed. I thought, what better place if you want to be alone in L.A. Yeah. than... Uh, <laughs> Than here on the I, side I, of the street I, I in my neighborhood. So. Were, were you uh, were you out there during the holidays at all? Were you out there oh, for? God, did was, you ever oh, go through oh, an earthquake oh, out there? Oh, Do you know? Oh, 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 how did you know? Both. <laughs> Christmas in Los Angeles. What a depressing thing. Really? I mean, I didn't know it was there. The only reason I knew Christmas was happening is I heard it on the radio. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> I, and I decided, I, look, I decided I'm getting too bogged down on my own projects. I was going to help people needier uh, than I. So mm -hmm. I, I decided to apply to the suicide hotline and answer suicide, suicide calls for Commendable. Christmas. Commendable, sure. I really was going to do it. They sent me an application that was six pages long. Mm -hmm. I filled it out. I had to go down for an interview. In the course of the interview, they told me I might have to go to school for six weeks to learn how to answer these calls. Yeah. I said, oh, no, school? I wanted to answer suicide calls for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> they said, listen, Mr. Gray, I I'm afraid that we recommend that you go into therapy. Yeah. <laughs> really, this really, really. Well, you can understand that. They, they don't want goofballs talking to these people on the phone. You know, they I, have to screen them out I a little bit. I was so sincere. And don't, don't I look like a Brahmin wasp still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Based on what I've seen of Brahmin wasps, sure. <laughs> Uh, most of them are goofballs, but, 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 overbred Irish citizens. And, and then you, you had some, you were there for an earthquake or not there for an earthquake? We just arrived. It was hot and Renee was in bed, sleeping late, naked under the sheets. I was writing in my underwear because it was so damned hot out there. There wasn't a sound. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it felt like a, uh, they were testing a neutron bomb or something. It was a shock wave hit yeah. the side of the house. Yeah. The entire house just started like this. Renee leaped up and said, it's the earthquake. Run for the door jam. Somewhere, she's red. You're supposed to stand in the stand door jam. She's the, the discipline yeah. to do it. Uh -huh. She runs naked to the door jam. I'm trying to get past her. She's jammed in the jam. I can't get under her. <laughs> and I kind of wedge under. The whole house is turning to jello. I get out in the front lawn, and suddenly, there are all my neighbors in their underwear, all waving. Welcome to California. It's the only time I saw them. The like a, only time. a little brunch or something on the lawn. <laughs> uh, what? What? We'll, uh, okay, we'll do a commercial. Then we'll be back here with uh, Sheldon Gray. Okay, uh, Mr. Gray, your show at Lincoln Center runs until January 20th. Monster in a Box. Right. Continued success. Have a great Thank holiday you. and a good new year. Same to you. Uh, my thanks to uh, Bev Tanner, John Hype. John, John, thanks for coming back. You saved this show. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to Brent Musburger. Uh, tomorrow, uh, well, we'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everybody.